Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to um, CCIS. Uh, it's uh, great to see all of you here on the table and welcome also to everyone uh, joining us online on Zoom. Um, this is the first uh, event of the spring semester. Um, so we're delighted to be kicking off a great series of events uh, uh, that we're organizing this term. Um, my name is Killian Clark. Um, I'm an assistant professor of political science here at CCAS um, and SFS. Um, and I'm very excited to be welcoming you all back to campus and also very excited to be welcoming Dr. Sarah Parkinson, um, who is here to discuss her latest book, uh, Beyond the Lines, Social Networks and Palestinian Militant Organizations in Wartime Lebanon. And the book is so freshly hot off the press that I think it was it was published what two two days ago. Or officially published, officially published or officially released. <laughs> so the hot the hot press copies are waiting for you outside um, and are available for sale. And we hope that you all will take advantage of uh, the fact that they are they're here for sale and available. And, and Sarah, I'm sure, would be happy to sign them for you if you're interested. Um, Dr. Parkinson is the um, Aronson Assistant Professor in Political Science and International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Her research um, is broad ranging. Um, it examines uh, organizational behavior and social change in contexts of war and disaster. Um, it focuses on the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and Dr. Parkinson studies a range of questions, including how actors such as militant organizations, emergency response agencies, and humanitarian groups adapt in the face of crisis, disruption, and fragmentation. Her research and fieldwork has taken her to many different parts of the MENA region, including Palestine, Lebanon, Kurdistan, uh, and most recently to Qatar. Um, and so in terms of the structure of the evening, um, we're going to have Dr. Parkinson give uh, about 40 minutes of uh, remarks about her new book. Um, and then we will open things up to Q&A. I will start off and, and open with a couple of questions to get the conversation going. Um, and then we will, uh, we will open up to the room and we'll take questions from folks gathered here around the table and also from the audience that we have assembled online. Um, for those of you on Zoom, you can put the questions that you have uh, in the Q&A feature uh, of the of the of the Zoom uh, room, and our events manager Coco will then take those questions and field them and 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 um, deliver them live here. Um, so with that, let me welcome Dr. Sarah Parkinson, and uh, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark, and thank you to all of CCAS faculty, students, and staff, and especially to Coco for helping to make this happen. Um, as Dr. Clark said, this is. Now my latest, this is my first book. This is a great story of taking too long to write a book, um, but it's entitled Beyond the Lines, Social Networks and Palestinian Militant Organizations in Wartime Lebanon. I'm gonna put a photo up just because this is actually the only picture I happen to have of the view down from the hills of South Lebanon to the coast. So I'm gonna ask you to ignore that white building, which is actually a UN base and it's blurry, so I'm not breaking any laws here. But what I wanna do is take you from your seats here in this room and on Zoom in your living rooms to the hills and the beaches of South Lebanon in June, 1982, where a young woman named Munaydele is watching the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, advance up the coastal highway, which is actually right here in the picture. Munaydele is deployed just behind the Palestinian guerrilla lines in Saida, which is a major coastal city in South Lebanon. She's been well trained to use the AK-47 that's slung around her neck. On this day, however, it isn't her job to use it. Munaydele is a nurse and she sees the fighters' positions primarily in terms of their distance from the sterile operating rooms of a nearby hospital. Instead of training her sights on the approaching Israeli forces, she scans for Palestinian casualties to transfer into an ambulance for the jaw-clenching rubber to the road ride to a medical facility. When Munaydali drew the fighters' positions for me in the spring of 2011, she sketched them as a semicircle to the south of a dot representing the hospital. Her puzzle was how to get injured guerrillas from the semicircle to the dot without being obliterated by the IDF's ongoing bombardment. Back and forth, back and forth until the Palestinian lines collapsed, at which point Munaydali retreated with others to the hospital. She was treating patients when bombs started falling around the, around the medical facility itself. With each shuddering impact, the medical workers paused their suturing, withdrew a syringe, or pulled a little more tightly on an unsecured bandage. 
Those in charge decided to evacuate. In the chaos, anyone who was still physically capable grabbed stretchers, wheelchairs, or gurneys as wounded civilians and soldiers streamed out of the hospital. Munaidale believes that there were still people in the building when a gas tank received a direct hit, creating an explosion that engulfed the facility in flames. Then the arrests began, she told me, and Saral Dunya Salda, the world became black. Raised in a family associated with the leftist Arab nationalist movement, Munaidale knew her way around weapons and served in frontline combat positions. But when she described her career trajectory to me, Munaidale emphasized the other roles she had played as battlefield medic, trauma nurse, ambulance driver, social worker, and logistician. When she told me her story, she emphasized how much skill went into these different forms of labor, how much education and training they required, and the degree to which taking on these assignments required her to trust and to be trusted. She asked me to call her Munaidale, which translates from Arabic as a struggler, rather than to identify her as a mukatila, a fighter. She wasn't and had never been just a fighter. Another veteran who I'll tell you about in a minute asked me to call her Zahra or flower. This seemingly delicate choice harks back to a specific role in the resistance. The girl's wing of the military scouting unit of Fatah, a leading Palestinian faction was called the Zahra, the plural of Zahra. Each of these women wanted her experiences understood in terms of both her individual story and as representative of the complicated realities associated with participating in an armed national project. Ooh. Every armed conflict involves backstage labor, that is logistical intelligence, medical finance and human resources work that facilitates movement continuity, resilience and survival, but that may not involve using a weapon. Indeed, most experienced militants with whom I've spoken do not consider the physical labor of killing the most important aspect of armed conflict. Rather, these militants approach unconventional warfare as a series of challenges centered around information, logistics, and coordination. When they were at war, they needed to keep mobile forces supplied, identify collaborators, disrupt rival belligerence operations, and provide essential services such as healthcare to their members and to the populations on whose support they depended. So beyond the line simultaneously traces the processes of social change and the emergent modes of organization that allowed Palestinian militant groups to survive in 1980s Lebanon in the context of the Israeli occupation, Syrian occupation, and the various aspects or stages of the Lebanese civil war. So this slide, or actually this photo, for example, which is really blurry up there for which I apologize, is a still from the Palestine Liberation Organization's original footage of a medical team racing a patient to an underground emergency room during the siege of a refugee camp in the late 1980s. And the lesson that comes from this is that the militant organizations that persist do so because they have found ways to negotiate the challenges that I've just discussed. So here I want to introduce a couple of terms. Great. <clears throat> The book is interested in adaptation, survival, and resilience, these sorts of terms. And I take an expressly relational or social network approach to studying this. The terms that I use are on which uh, the argument and the theory are based. The first two terms are relational plasticity and social infrastructure. Now, plasticity and a couple of the terms that I'll introduce today are actually pulled from a metaphor, uh, a neuroscience metaphor that I use in the book and some of my other work that is about ideas of neural repair, right? What happens when uh, neurons are damaged and are able to reorganize themselves and form new maps and achieve new tasks. So plasticity is about that inherent ability to form new connections, right? So neuroplasticity is that ability within the brain. Relational plasticity is within relationships, within friendships, within work relationships within relationships in a military hierarchy, for example. Social infrastructure is about overlapping networks. So if you think about what a military organization looks like, it's a hierarchy, top to bottom. But think about how all of the people in that are in multiple networks at the same time. Someone who is a soldier is also a spouse, is also a sibling, is also a member of a sports team, is also a member of a dance team, is also that annoying neighbor whose dog is barking all night. Right, so social infrastructure 
is about the way in which different social networks overlap and people crisscross uh, through them. So I'm gonna introduce you to another person now, and this is Zahra. So like Munaidle and many other militants, Zahra started off her political and military career as a scout at a very young age. As a teenager, she survived the months long 1976 siege of Tala Zatar camp, which used to be in East Beirut. Right-wing Lebanese militias blockaded the camp in January 1976 as the Lebanese civil war was escalating. They besieged the population throughout the summer before eventually massacring survivors following the camp's surrender in August 1976. Zahra and her family fled to a village outside Beirut, where she became a military instructor, drilling dozens of other young women eager to fight as guerrillas for the Palestinian resistance. They moved again and were living in South Beirut in September 1982, when militiamen affiliated with the Lebanese Kataib, the South, South Lebanon Army, the SLA, and other predominantly Christian militias entered the Shatila district disappearing and killing between two and 3,000 predominantly Palestinian, but also Egyptian, Syrian, Lebanese, Kurdish civilians. Zahra again escaped, but she returned 40 days later for demonstrations that memorialized the victims. Worried about being arrested, she concealed the Palestinian flag that she had brought along in tribute to the victims in her clothing. At the last moment, standing under the mass grave south of the camp, she pulled it out and laid it gently on the dirt. Throughout the 1980s, Zahra served in both social service and intelligence positions. Even as a wanted person, she continued to travel incognito into a blockaded camp to teach in an informal school that the residents organized. People, she underscored to me, didn't want their children getting behind in their education. Fairly practical human being here. She also used her position as a cover to smuggle messages and supplies into the camp for a guerrilla faction. At one point, a childhood friend from Tal Azatur, who was affiliated with a rival Syrian allied Palestinian faction, saved Zahra from a prison sentence by destroying her intelligence file. Her luck ran out about a year later when the Mohabarat, so this is the Syrian State Intelligence Services, captured and incarcerated her in a notorious prison under the Beau Rivage Hotel in Beirut. Upon her release, she went straight back to political work. This time she moved into a subunit focused on social aid, becoming an active member of the General Union of Palestinian Women. <clears throat> Excuse me. Over the course of her career as a militant, Zahra survived multiple camp sieges, several massacres, imprisonment, torture, and constant surveillance by rival Palestinian factions, Lebanese militias, the Lebanese Armed Forces, and the Syrian Muhabarat. At one point during the 1990s, the Syrians actually under, uh, installed a checkpoint directly under her family home uh, in, a, in an attempt to rearrest her. So she responded by sleeping at friends' houses for the better part of a decade with her shoes on and her street clothes um, to avoid arrest. Despite intense violence, repression, and at times the lack of her own faction's popularity within the Palestinian refugee population, she remained loyal to Fatah. When I asked her why she remained active, even after being tortured, she told me, I didn't train to fight because I love war. I trained to fight because I love life. So simplified accounts of militant decision-making that dominate particularly in my discipline, which is political science, mask the processes that shape the kinds of outcomes that interest me, which are organizational survival and change, and specifically the, or, the evolution or the emergence of new forms of organization. And I'll talk about those in just a second. But these accounts present, I argue, a sanitized if parsimonious account of interstate conflict dynamics. Accounts that highlight and even sensationalize fighters specifically, and fighters sort of assume that those are male fighters in most stories that we tell in political science. I realize that that is not the case in many disciplines. They ignore the grand majority of highly skilled opposition activity and the role that it plays in armed conflict. So in Beyond the Lines, I'm interested in de-emphasizing battlefield scorecards, which emphasize the actions of fighters in favor of analyzing how both combatant and non-combatant labor shape organizational and political trajectories. So the argument here is that understanding people's lived experiences of conflict is not simply a humanitarian necessity, it's a political imperative. So just to take a second and have you think through the logic that I'm about to walk through, 
I argue, so I told you about social infrastructure a second ago, that militant groups' ability to adapt and to produce emergent organizations flows from interactions between repertoires of wartime violence, and repertoires are just sort of the set of practices that organizations deploy as they make political claims. So this is Elizabeth Jean Wood's definition. I'm gonna argue that distinct repertoires of violence have different effects in terms of the way that people interpret them and their simultaneous network effects. All right, so in terms of what can happen within a network, if someone can be a member of a network or not be a member of a network, they can leave a network, they might resign from a job, they might pass away, they might leave a country. They can also join a network, they can be recruited, they can marry into a family. So there are those sorts of dichotomies, but there are also the ways in which people are tied together and the meanings embedded in those types of ties. And that's part of what I'm gonna talk about today and how those ties are affected by violence. So to draw a little bit upon our current pandemic context, and it is still current, I want you to ask about what a death that occurs when someone is denied access to healthcare feels like versus one where someone has refused healthcare. This is not to argue that both aren't tragic, but it is to say that even though in both cases someone has died, they are different. They are fundamentally different. They have different political implications, particularly in the setting in which we sit. And the argument that I make more broadly about how we understand warfare is that you cannot understand the meaning of wartime casualties and repression without understanding the social context in which that's all occurring. So thinking of Zahra's experience in Tel El-Zahra as someone who survived a massacre fundamentally shapes how she responds to Sabra Shatila. Um, and just to give you an idea of the sorts of meanings that are imbued with the Sabra Shatila massacre, this is actually a document that um, this man's father showed me when I was doing interviews about the massacre. And it's his temporary employment papers for UNICEF that he provided over when the family was searching for him. He still hasn't been found. His family still doesn't know what happened. Part of the argument here is that there is a subjective difference between that man dying and disappearing. Okay. The really simplified sort of stripped down version of this, and this goes back to the neuroscience metaphor that I'm employing, is that there are three core network processes, which are repurposing, remapping, and emergence. In neuroscience, it's reconsolidation. So I also switch between emergence and reconsolidation throughout the book. The idea is that repurposing is taking an existing relationship and using it to new ends. I have a professional friend. Now I ask that professional friend to borrow money. That's usually not something that we associate with a professional friend maybe a friend, maybe a family member, but there are constitutive meanings that are tied in to certain types of social relationships. Remapping is gonna be if a ton of people in my workplace start asking other people in the workplace to borrow money, where you are systematically seeing people use these relationships and switching them over to a new type of relationship or layering a new relationship on them. Emergence is when because this becomes systematized, institutionalized, when there are rules and skills and practices that are all layered onto this network. And you might actually see, for example, some sort of money lending system that is now present within the workplace that wasn't previously. So we can think of how you could say, okay, now I know that a new organization has emerged versus one is not present previously. All right. So. A quick sort of uh, overview of the research design. Oh, that's a shame. I hope it's gonna, let's see. All right. Well, sorry about that little label up there. That's supposed to be pre-1982. I'm not sure what happened to it. Um, but the bottom line is that one of the points that I make about wartime violence is that it is not consistent or constant. So a conflict of the type that I study, we're going to call it intrastate war, civil war, insurgency, irregular conflict, whatever, it might feature aerial bombardment some months, hit and run guerrilla attacks in, during others, periods of ostensible calm punctuated by kidnappings and disappearances. Some cities, herbal where I've worked comes to mind may remain relatively untouched by violence, even as populations only a few dozen kilometers away, Mosul in this particular case, are occupied and completely destroyed. 
Interstate conflicts reach directly into people's neighborhoods and homes via tactics such as informing and siege with a massive human cost. So just to give an example outside of the Middle East, the 1,417 day siege of Sarajevo, which was 1992 to 1995, killed nearly 19,000 people and caused infrastructural damage to the city that totaled US 18.5 billion. Experts have estimated that the Syrian regime incarcerated approximately 1.2 million of its citizens between 2011 and 2019, right? So thinking about the variations in violence that we see in these conflicts, they're not just about homicide, they're not just about aerial bombardment. <clears throat> Only some of these actions occur at the hands of the average combat soldier who is the focus of so much scholarship on these topics. Other actions take the form of backstage labor. They are the responsibility of regime agents in clean pressed suits who may snatch activists off the streets, torture them in basement dungeons and return to middle-class houses in safe districts at the end of the day. Some, like the Russian social media disinformation campaigns that have become a hallmark of the Syrian civil war are carried out by attractive young women carefully styled in hipster clothing and speaking from safe modern apartments. Anti-regime newsletters may be the product of anonymous digital collectives brought together on Telegram. Now in my interviewees days, they were the product of secret meetings, newsprint paid for with smuggled dollars and a bribed Xerox repairman for those of you who remember Xerox machines and it might be like two of us in this room. <laughs> so in the conflicts that I studied, Lebanese and Palestinian women dressed in the latest fashions of yes, the 1980s, which I also realize are back or now back and past. Um, but mini skirts, gold jewelry, bright blue eyeshadow. And they carried out some of the most daring smuggling operations of the time period. New forms of grassroots activism, as Rana Khori, of, uh, recently of Northwestern University and now of the University of Illinois, has shown might spring from areas that receive foreign aid, sharing their activities with each other on platforms such as Facebook. So, how does one go about studying these dynamics? There's a lot of stuff going on here. And maybe that's why it took me 10 years to write this book. But the book's research design in its simplest form examines war in, 1980, in 1980s Lebanon temporally, spatially, and organizationally. So I study the time period between the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the PLO's withdrawal to 1990 uh, at the end of the subconflict that defined Palestinian politics in Lebanon for years to come, the War of the Camps. So in 1982, the PLO's organizational apparatus, which was headquartered at the time in Lebanon, I can go more deeply into this history in the Q&A if people really want it, uh, along with hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, about approximately half of whom were living in UN refugee camps at the time, experienced a massive shock when the IDF invaded with the express goal of rooting out the PLO's armed forces. The IDF moved directly north of Lebanon's coastal highway, defeating PLO forces as it went. The refugee camp sustained heavy damage in its wake, most were about 50 to 80% destroyed. At the end of August, 1982, the PLO's international apparatus, including around 14,000 fighters, was deported from Lebanon to Tunisia, Yemen, Syria, and a number of other countries in the region. So, as of September, 1982, the refugee camps in Beirut, Saida, and Sur were almost entirely undefended. So those 14,000 guerrillas who left were sort of the trained forces, regular forces also left. Um, and what were left were the more irregular or camp level militia forces. From 1982 to 1990, each camp experienced different forms of civil war and occupation violence. From 1982 to 1985, so we have Saida and Sur there, the IDF occupied Saida and Sur while the Christian government and supporting militias controlled West Beirut. And there are refugee camps in each of these cities. From 1985 to 1988, a Lebanese militia, Harakat Amal, tried to expel all members of the PLO from the camps in each city, but used different violent tactics, and there's a different repertoire of violence in each one. So I study variation in militant factions organization, and this is across all Palestinian militant factions, PLO or not, across each stage of this conflict. Now, what am I looking for? I'm looking for network structure and shifts in it, and I'm looking for differences in the interpretations of violence. So I know and I established their different repertoires of violence. The question is how they shape social networks 
and do I get emergent organizations? The approach was ethno-historical, so I spent approximately two years in Lebanon and what one would call, if you're an anthropologist or a sociologist, an ethnographic research design. It's ethno-historical, so I was immersed in the everyday lives of my interlocutors for an extended period of time working in the local language and specifically the local dialect um, with a focus on the everyday. Now, I can't sit in, in this case, 2009 to 2010 Lebanon and see what was happening in 1982. That's why this is ethno-historical. Being situated in social relationships allows me to ask about the past. So if I'm hanging out in a faction's office and people are arguing about healthcare reimbursements, for example, I'm gonna take that opportunity to ask what healthcare was like in the 1980s or the 1970s, which is in fact something I've done. When I see salaries getting paid out in cash dollars, I'm going to ask if that's how it used to be done, right? But the, the advantage of just being there and seeing things how they happen is to see all these little banalities of what political life looks like and specifically factional life. And I spent a lot of time specifically with Fatah's women's office. So one of the things that I helped with, for example, or that I was around for was designing a poster for Nakba Day in 2010 and go running around looking for snapshots of women to put on this poster and learning that it's much harder to find pictures of some officers versus others. I use a ton of archival materials, both text and film. So I already mentioned some of the film footage that the Palestine Liberation Organization gave me. I also use the Palestinian Oral History Archive that's located at the American University of Beirut. Use the archives at a uh, newspaper, which is a Lebanese newspaper. Um, can talk about the political affiliations of the different newspapers that I use, which is really important. There's an underground newspaper that I was able to access at the Institute for Palestine Studies um, called Salka Mohayim that I'll talk about in a little bit and actually show you one of the pages from it. Um, what I'm interested in doing between interviews, between immersion in relationships, between archives, I'm also using like English language newswires from the time, um, for a lot of journalists, the only way to access South Lebanon, particularly during the occupation, was from being um, uh, having a byline in Jerusalem, not actually in Beirut, because you had to go in through the occupied areas. But I'm interested in how people experience their ties to other actors and how they're affected by violence. Um, one of the really useful things that I was able to access were Arabic language memoirs, both by PLO officers and by ordinary people who have now written down their experiences. I'm reconstructing, and particularly through interviews, I'm trying to reconstruct egocentric networks. So I start interviews with, tell me about your family, right? Who are your brothers and sisters? Who's your mother? Politics tend to run in families in a lot of ways. That doesn't mean everyone's in the same faction, and that's actually important for my argument because of the connections across factions that run through families or that run through soccer teams. So walking with someone through the Sabra market in Beirut, who is a member of one faction and having him high five a bunch of guys who I know are from another faction, I'm like, what's up? He's like, oh yeah, I played football with them in the 1970s. Okay, bro, that's awesome. Tell me more about that. All right. Looking for when people drop out of networks, for when relationships are severed. So this, for example, is an obituary that I found in that underground Palestinian newspaper that I mentioned where they ran obituaries because that was the only way other than word of mouth that people could learn who had died. This particular man's family actually hadn't really known the story of his death, which is covered in the obituary. Um, he died in a battle in the Shouf Mountains during the shelling from a US gunship that was off the coast of Lebanon. So giving these materials to the family was something that actually switched how they understood his particular absence from that network. Right. What I'm going to do now is actually take you into one of the empirical chapters uh, of the book. This is uh, one that I wrote after the initial dissertation project, to be totally honest, because I didn't go looking for the material in here. This is material that emerged over years and years of me pretty much not asking about it because I thought asking about collaboration was too sensitive. Um, the material in this particular chapter came from an archive that I haven't mentioned yet, but the American Friends Service Committee archive. Um, thank you, Alana Feldman, for writing your book because it let me know that there was an amazing archive somewhere. And I thought, oh, I wonder if there's anything about Lebanon in there. There is. Thank you, American Friends Service. Your archives are fantastic. Um, 
What I am looking at in this particular chapter, it is chapter five. The argument that I am making is that specifically collective experiences of violence against home and family in South Lebanon in that 1982 to 1985 period push people to remap quotidian roles and ties in two specific ways. First is that there is gendered collective mobilization as mothers, as wives, as, sis as sisters in response to mass incarceration and community targeting. When I say mass incarceration, I mean that in the summer of 1982, approximately 10,000 men were taken and put into a prison camp in South Lebanon called Ansar Prison Camp. So when you get to the spring of 1983, you have journalists walking through the refugee camps in Saida and Sor saying there are no men, okay? The second part of this is cross-factional, task-differentiated, and specifically intergenerational networks that cooperate to fight collaborators and informants. Talking about repertoires of violence, what is salient in South Lebanon at this time? So what comes out in interviews? What is coming through in the archives? What are the things that are really shaping people's lives? The big one is mass incarceration. Right. So Lala Khalili estimates that between 10,000 and 15,000 men were incarcerated in the 1982 to 1985 period just in the main prison camps. That doesn't speak to the sort of archipelago of detention centers, of the prisons in Israel, of the various sort of local basements where people were um, interrogated or jailed either by the IDF, by Mossad, or by Lebanese militias. And all of those are possibilities, and many people experienced all of that. Community destruction during the initial invasion, um, aerial bombardment was huge. In the aftermath, what you do get from the Lebanese militias in this particular area are evictions and disappearances. So they're pushing people out of their homes. Um, in some parts of the region, you have arson to basically um, take neighborhoods for the militias. And you have infiltration and collaboration. This starts on the beaches when people are picked out by collaborators in the early stages of um, the invasion. This is one that people know from a lot of other secondary material. But then part of what I'm looking at is what happens afterwards in communities. Um, so for example, this is an archival document that I used where an aid worker is talking extensively about one of the collaborators who's present in Rashidiya camp, which is outside of Sur in South Lebanon. And it gives like a really detailed account of how he's behaving. So what comes through in the evidence that I'm gathering, right? There is this absence of men. People remember all of the men and their families being arrested, but they also think more broadly in terms of these are attacks on family and home, right? People are being pushed out of their homes. Their homes are being invaded. Militias are coming into the homes and wrecking them. People are literally booby trapping their doors at night because they are so worried about people coming into their homes. There are also disappearances and lynchings, right? So this is showing up in interviews where so many people who I interviewed are saying like, look, the Lebanese forces in Saida were killing people and they would drop them on the side of the road. And the goal was to be like, we can do this, right? But it's also coming through, like this is an interview, this is corroborated in both Arabic and English language newspapers, where you have the Associated Press basically reporting when bodies are being found. Things get so out of control in 1983 with these sorts of killings that the IDF starts trying to stop, starts trying to control the Lebanese militias that are working with it, right? Because they realize that this is contributing to mayhem and actually to extensive mobilization. So in this context, you have meeting making processes that are, ungird, that are undergirding mobilization of the people who are living in two camps in Saida and three camps in Sur, all right? It's predominantly women, children, and the elderly. You do see men starting to get released from prison. They're under constant threat of arrest, of targeting, of lynching, et cetera. People are mobilizing and specifically women are mobilizing in spite of conditions of fear. So in a lot of the literature on mobilization in sociology and in political science, there's this assumption that fear has to be overcome. There is a threshold where you sort of lose fear if enough people are out on the street or you somehow tuck it away and don't think about it. People didn't talk like that about these experiences. They were like, we were terrified constant. We could not sleep. We had to wake up in the middle of the night to make sure everyone was still there, right? 
Fear becomes constitutive of the experience and of the networks that are mobilizing in this particular setting, right? As people are making connections and specifically women across factions are making connections to each other. They're also working to commemorate populations that have suffered from violence. So this is that uh, clandestine newspaper, uh, which is being smuggled into the refugee camps by 1983 and 1984. And this is um, an issue that in part commemorates the Sabra Shatila massacre and says, we're not going to let this happen again. So people are thinking directly about what's going on in other spaces. So this is not sort of an independent variable situation. There is, people are talking, people are sharing information, newspapers are bringing news of things that are happening. So what are the outcomes in terms of this mobilization? You have a nonviolent protest movement that's directly targeting the United Nations, for example, and that's trying to internationalize narratives of victimhood that is expressly gendered. Women are saying, the men of these communities are in jail. We are vulnerable. We do not have proper housing. We do not have a way to make money. We do not have means to have food. The IDF is responsible and someone has to take care of us. So local organizations are doing things like hosting journalists in their meeting rooms, all right? Now in terms of collaboration, and I know I need to wrap up pretty soon. What's interesting when it comes to collaboration is that the archival material lets me actually look at different types of collaboration. So it was structured differently in CIDA versus in SUR. CIDA had been sort of an epicenter of political mobilization for different Palestinian factions. It's Aina Helwe is still the biggest refugee camp in Lebanon um, and had a really dynamic political community there in the 1970s and through the 1980s. In Saida, the Israelis set up a, the, what's called the Palestinian National Guard, which is a collaborator militia. It's staffed by Palestinians. They're in uniform. They work for the Israelis. They're masked, okay? They're institutionalized, but they're not professionalized. So when people talk about them, they'll be like, yeah, this is a bunch of guys who are like drunk and throwing bottles in the alleyways, but they're like fronting, like they're thuggish, right? And that's a word that is used in the archives. What are they doing? They're knocking on doors, they're conducting home invasions, they're harassing women. Um, but what you also see is concerted Israeli attempts to infiltrate certain Palestinian institutions. So um, various training academies, schools, they're trying to get doctors to work with them, they're trying to get teachers to work with them. Um, they're trying to make sure that in the Palestinian schools, the principals are sympathetic to the IDF. All right. Um, so what you see in some of the archives, you see things in the interviews, but also in the archives where um, the American Friends Service Committee representative actually refers to some of these organizations as like taking on village lead qualities, which is a reference to collaborators in the West Bank. In Sur, which if you'll remember is a little bit south of Saida, you actually have direct Israeli patrols and camps. One thing that's worth noting is that Aina Helwe, which is in Saida, uh, fought extremely, extremely hard during the invasion. It held out for seven days, whereas other camps held out for a couple of days. Um, people will tell you that the Israelis were terrified of Aina Hedwe. Um, and that's sort of the, the lore that has grown up there. Whatever it was, the IDF was much more comfortable patrolling in the, in the Southern camps versus in Aina Hedwe. They put the Palestinian National Guard in Aina Hedwe. So you have direct Israeli patrols and you have collaborators who are not masked and they're doing things like extorting from people's um, humanitarian aid money. Um, and you have humanitarian workers who are actually saying like, look, we had a situation where people were being extortionate and angry drunk, in this case, waving a pistol at an aid worker. And the IDF is happy about this because this guy is scaring people who are working with Palestinians. What I want you to take from this is just that there are different structures even of collaboration. That's what matters for this story. And this is you know, just a copy of the archival material that talks expressly about this particular extortionate official, but also directly compares within the archives and of an organization, look, this is what SIDA looks like, this is what SUR looks like. So in this context, what I look at is this intergenerational network where you have task differentiation between age groups. So anyone in here have kids? 
what do kids like to do if like parents are having some sort of semi-secret political conversation at home that you really don't want them telling anyone about? Just immediately repeat it, right? Like, this is what kids do. This is what bad friends do. But like, especially your like sort of like three to nine-year-old realm is like big trouble if you are in like the business of trying not to get caught running a secret organization. So you actually have to sit here and, and educate children like, we do not talk to strangers. In a community where doors used to be open and people used to visit each other, you do not open the door when someone knocks on the door, right? So this is a process of re-education where protecting a family from collaboration and infiltration starts with that three-year-old saying like, we have to undo the hospitality that we have taught you because it will endanger this family. You have to teach a child in terms that the child understands. So this is about black and white, good and bad, People you don't know, bad. If you might know them and don't, don't take risks. But also telling them stories and saying like, look, the gorillas are like you, right? There's a gorilla who comes to the door, you know them, you help them, right? So there are these stories that are told through NGOs and through families to help socialize children into this extraordinarily difficult environment that they're in. Now, if we were gonna draw this out in network terms, this wouldn't show up, right? This is a valence change. We are taking three-year-olds in the network and shifting how they see the world because you have to for the protection of the family and for a larger movement. <laughs> we start at the bottom with like these three-year-olds to nine-year-olds. The role that youth play in this, you had a huge Palestinian apparatus in Lebanon from the 1970s onward from the 1960s really, but the 1970s, you have Black September in Jordan, PLO apparatus moves to Lebanon. So you have all of these youth who have been members of dance teams, of sports teams, of scouting organizations. Their job becomes to identify collaborators and put up posters on the walls. Their job is not to do anything to the collaborators. Their job is identification, right? Um, this is also, you have elderly people getting involved in this. So one of the people I knew who had been in a guerrilla organization, was like, look, there was this little old lady. And when she, she would like go and stand next to a collaborator and like, oops, drop a bag of groceries. And that's how we knew we had to target that person, right? He never knew who that little old lady was. He didn't know where she lived or any of it. He knew what the signal was. They knew to look for the posters. They knew to look for all these different little signs, right? That is click behavior. They could never report on each other. So it's the gorillas that come in and then start killing people. And this shows up in the newspapers, again, both Arabic and English from the time. So you see a concerted effort to take revenge on the collaborators. But also if we think of it in the terms of political science, this is community defense, right? So from this particular chapter, the conclusions that I put forward in line with the book, of course, is that the nature of violence is shaping how it shapes um, networks and is spurring new meaning making processes, right? Collaboration is a particular type of violence that has particular meaning, especially as we're talking about what's happening to homes and families. We're looking at gendered frames and that's what incarceration is doing, right? Women were incarcerated, but they were incarcerated by the hundreds, not by the thousands into the tens of thousands. We're thinking, and I can talk about this in the Q&A, in political science, a lot of people use the terms selective and indiscriminate. To anyone who is living in this setting, all of this is indiscriminate. It does not matter if a militia comes to your door and says, we're pulling out your son, because it is this larger effort and because it is embedded in this larger repertoire of violence, it all feels indiscriminate, period. That is how it went to people. So this is about linking perceptions to action as opposed to intentions to action. For the larger book, and this is why if you saw at the beginning, I only show the top half of the picture, but this is the bottom half, right? Thinking about all of this as a whole. So the relationship between non-kinetic warfare, community response and overarching conflict dynamics. So you can't understand conflict if you're just looking from here down, right? The centrality of non-combat roles, that's the here up. Right, thinking through people's range of participation and their experiences, their simultaneous experiences 
through all of the different roles that they are playing in these organizations, in their communities, in their families, right? Um, and that that is changing over time. Very, very few people enter a war in the position that they end a war. And that goes for any military organization, right? Um, and the last bit, which somehow like dropped below, but whatever, um, is thinking about violence seriously as experience, not as statistics. There is a lot of violence that you just cannot get numbers on. Um, the UN stopped keeping track of deaths in Syria. That doesn't mean that violence isn't going on. It's that it is impossible to track, but also there is so much going on that is having social and political and economic effects under behind the scenes that we need to consider that if we're actually gonna understand any of these settings and their aftermath. So I'll end on a slide of South Lebanon, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Ask me, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm sure folks have a lot of questions, and uh, so we're going to have a discussion now. Give everyone a chance to. Um... I just saw myself on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> um, so we're going to give uh, everyone a chance to voice their questions. I'm going to start off with a couple, but before I do, I just want to say, you know, what a fantastic presentation and project and book this is um, the way that you I mean you're dealing with this sort of you know this sort of big political science question and then coming at it with all of this wonderful theory and field work and empirics and kind of taking a whole fresh perspective on these sort of timeless questions of you know why do militant organizations endure what makes them what makes them strong what makes them persist how do they recruit members and just taking this fresh lens to it and bringing this wonderful um, new perspective. So, uh, so congratulations first. Um, I'll ask two questions. One is uh, directly about what you presented on, um, and then one is sort of on a topic that you didn't present on, which may be in the book, and, and so maybe it'll give you a chance to talk about some stuff that you didn't get uh, have time to talk about. Um, the first question, which is about uh, the, the, the main um, material in the presentation. So, you know, there's this, I study protest and repression. Right. Well. So, so there's this puzzle that we have in, in protest studies of, of sort of, you know, repression in some cases has a demobilizing effect. And then in other cases, there's this backlash effect. And, you know, there's all these, they're mostly quantitative studies that try to mm -hmm. puzzle this out. What are the conditions in which people respond to, to repression with more protests or, or, or they respond by, you know, going home mm -hmm. and sort of, and I feel like you have some, some wonderful evidence and material to shed light on this puzzle. And so I'm one, so you gave us some, some, some anecdotes and some, some, some evidence and some material to, to explain the conditions under which very, very severe violence generates collect, what you called gendered collective globalization. Mm -hmm. What are the conditions in which the opposite occurs, right? What are the, what are the conditions in which sort of meaning-making processes don't produce that outrage, that-, that, that In which like, repression that, works, in other words? Exactly. <laughs> I don't I mean, deal in that industry. Give me some variables to test. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I no, very seriously, that's not a question I set out to answer. Um, I don't think it's, to be frank, I don't think it's ethical to go and ask people how to best repress them. Um, what I will say is that I think that one of the larger points of the work is that when we try to sort of narrow down like, oh, does this particular violent tactic work or how much fear works or whatever. Um, none of this should be studied in a vacuum. None of this happens in a vacuum. You can't study repression in a laboratory and you shouldn't be looking at it through like lab-like conditions, right? Because the repertoire is what's going to matter, right? So someone can say like, oh yes, like this particular thing works, but like if a hundred other things are going on at the same time, and if you're looking at fear, but not accounting for the incredible role of solidarity or what it means to still experience joy, like I would be doing these interviews and someone would like pull out their pictures from New Year's 1982 and they'd still be in like the 1980s. Like if anyone's seen like old vintage 1980s movies, they're still in like the 1980s, like formal dress with the giant sleeves and the V-neck and like the princess. So like there's so much that isn't accounted for, right? I think that what's more interesting is to ask about the different manifestations and how people cope and evolve in different ways. Um, I think that there are very, very, very few conditions in which repression totally works, so to speak. I think it's about how people choose to adapt and evolve and how we're thinking about resistance and how we're choosing to measure things like 
resistance or opposition or protest or whatever. And that some of that might not be visible. And I think one of the problems that I really have with like, you know, some of the experimental stuff on this is like, okay, what you want to see is some big protest somewhere against like ex dictator. And what you're probably missing is something that is much more nuanced and clever, right? And that might be because of our own blinders as academics. Like there are a lot of political contexts that I don't understand and that I don't know how to protest in and I'm not gonna sit around and tell people how to protest in them, right? So what's interesting is the creativity. That's what I wanna see. And it, in some cases, it might not be my business to go out and, and publicize that, right? And I feel that way with certain contemporary conflicts. Like this is in the 1980s. I feel okay about this. This isn't a secret to anyone. These are stories that have been handed down at this point. But like some stuff with contemporary protests, like, mm -mm. like leave it. Let people have their politics. Soapbox. <laughs> I know I really need a taller one. I should bring it with me. All right. So, so, so second question is about something that I know you have thought about in other work that you've done. Yeah. It's about space, right? So how, how, so, so your, the sites of your research are urban spaces, they're camps, uh, they, space, space figures prominently, I would imagine how these networks mm -hmm. are constructed. So how does that, how does that figure into the nature of these networks and the types of sort of resilience that you're seeing in them? Yeah. Um, so a couple different things. Um, the work is sort of centered and the narrative is sort of centered on the camps because the camps were spaces that were targeted so extensively. Um, only about 50% of Palestinian refugees to this day live in the recognized uh, United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East, um, like the formal camps. There are also what are called gatherings, which are like sort of smaller places that also still get UN services. Um, and there are neighborhoods that where just a lot of Palestinians live, right? Um, and the refugee camps don't look like sort of UNHCR tents. We're talking about sort of breeze block districts, right? These, these are built environments. Um, when it comes to space, a lot of the way that space comes to play is how these communities or how the communities that I'm studying are situated within broader, you know, urban or semi-urban, although when you get down to Rashidia, it's really actually kind of rural space pretty quickly, right? Um, so is one of the camps or one of these Palestinian neighborhoods directly next to a certain Lebanese neighborhood where there is a particular militia that's active? Um, when it comes to Aina Helwe, it matters an awful lot um, during the 1985 to 1988 period that there is, uh, a village called Magdushe, which is like situated a bit up in the hills that is elevated enough that people can shell the camp. Um, whereas that's not necessarily tactically possible in, in all of the other spaces to the same degree where it's like the looking down and they have to fight upwards towards Magdushe. There's a huge battle there during the war of the camps. What becomes really interesting, I would say is aspects of the war of the camps in South Beirut, which I write about in um, chapter six, Sure, chapter six, let's say that. Um, but where you have Shatila and Borja Barajni that are sort of nestled in what are fairly diverse South Beirut neighborhoods or Dahe neighborhoods, which, you know, today someone would, be, would say like, these are neighborhoods that are associated with Hezbollah. They used to be more diverse. They are still diverse in ways that people don't generally talk about. Um, but where there are certain modes of uh, organization that are actually enabled because there's so much intermarriage between Palestinians and Lebanese in these neighborhoods, um, which I also used to contest a whole lot of stuff on ethnic conflict because they're like, ah, oh, it must be like Sunnis versus Shia. Like, no, that's, that's not how Dahia works. Um, or it was not how Dahia worked at this period in time. I don't study Dahia today. Um, but where intermarriage and friendship and actually co-training between different organizations made particular modes of smuggling possible or made it possible to get medical supplies or whatever it was. So that gets really intriguing to me. It's also, if we go down to Sur in the, uh, in the period of the War of the Camps, Borja Shemani camp is right next to a Shia neighborhood. Um, and they actually declare neutrality during the War of the Camps. And that's in part due to what happened to Borja Shemani 
in um, 1982, where this is a camp that was just utterly destroyed during the invasion. And then the way that people talk about it is it, it was just like a family of 32 died here, um, where you know people were sheltering and entire buildings collapsed in on them. And they were like, we can't do more of this. Like our responsibility is to the camp population, not to sort of these broader political fights. And they declared neutrality specifically because of the neighborhood in which they were situated. Um, but that's that's one of the main ways that that I'm thinking about sort of built environment in this particular project. Fantastic. Let's open it up to other questions. Yes, please. Hi, thank you very much. Um, if everyone could just introduce yourself before you ask your question, that would be uh, thank hi, you. I'm Or I'm a freshman in the SFS. Um, thank you very much for your speech. Um, I have a quick question from a bit more of a security angle because I know that you mentioned. Uh, this is more from the perspective of the armed group, but at the same time, where there are so many destabilizing forces uh, within the MENA region, I'd imagine something of great interest to a lot of the governments uh, would be how to um, perhaps remove the influences of these groups from these smaller areas like the refugee camps or um, smaller areas or towns in the area. Um, and given that how you mentioned that a lot of these groups tend to have very close relations with each other or grow via family connections and such, do you believe that there are any effective means that can be used to remove some of these groups or perhaps make them less of a threat to established government? Or do you think that just because of how deeply entrenched they are, that these sorts of groups will continue to function uh, as part of everyday life going forward. So I would, let's start with thinking about threats posed to whom by whom. We're talking about a region where often the most threatening actor is the state. I would argue that's the case for Syria. Um, I would argue in a very different way that that might be the case in contemporary Lebanon. Right. Um, so I'm sort of, I find the question of what happens when states think they know what they're doing and go after groups, and then what happens next, because it is never what states plan. I think that's more interesting. Um, when it comes to removing groups, you're talking about removing people who exist in society. Now, states might not agree with those people, I might not agree with those people, but what interests me in the context of sort of this particular project is what's gonna happen when you start using collaborators really extensively, for example. And in the follow-up chapter to this one, in chapter seven, one of the things that I point out happened in CIDA, for example, is that you get really fragmented, um, personalized militias in CIDA, for example, that bring about a lot more violence, right? That this intense, overwhelming violence that was experienced by people and by organizations in CIDA brings about new types of violence that actually last into the current day. A lot of people like to blame those on ideology. Like, here's the thing, you'll meet Marxist Palestinians in Lebanon. Well, they used to be Marxists and now they're Islamists, right? Um, so what's really interesting is like, you can layer ideology in some cases onto an organizational forum. I'm interested in why that organizational form is there. That organizational form is there because particular modes of what were supposed to be eliminationist violence were used, right? So do I generally think that states who are trying to use, that are trying to use overwhelming violence are going to like succeed? No, I don't. Um, and I don't necessarily think that someone like me should be in the project of trying to figure out how to kill more people. Um, but I can say that the tactics that I've examined in this particular space did not work how they were in intended to. Um, the Israelis had to pull out of CIDA because their institutions were getting hit. Um, I forget exactly who it was right now, but one of the militant groups um, successfully blew up Mossad headquarters in Sur during the time period that I'm discussing, right? Um, Lebanon was Israel's Vietnam in many ways. And then that's worth really remembering when you're talking about the level of violence, the level of technology and the level of investment that the Israeli government put into Lebanon. Yeah. Marty. 
Thank you so much for this. Uh, this talk was really, really fascinating, and I have many questions, but I'll, the one I'll go with relates to a word that you used in response to Dr. Clark's first question, which is this this idea of creativity. Creativity, uh, okay. And I'm curious how uh, this creativity sort of relates to your other idea of plasticity, and mm -hmm. so how creative this plasticity is based on your field work. So namely, you know, did you find sort of particular typologies of changes in these networks in response to mm. like modalities or uh, repertoires of violence, for example, um, or were they like highly creative in sort of different regions? So it already took me 10 years to write this. Um, but no, that's actually an excellent question. And that that is the kind of stuff that fascinates me. Um, if you want, if you want the typology, you want Paul Stanilin's work, um, who is going to look at basically um, horizontal and vertical ties between societies and militant groups. Um, and one of sort of, I won't call one of the decisions that I made with this particular work is to really get down into the nitty gritty and to get down into these egocentric networks. I didn't have, I didn't want to, I didn't want to create a typology because I wanted to prioritize emphasizing other things and particularly these emergent organizations. Um, what in general interests me is how particular um, network positions emerge as being um, agents of change, right? So um, chapter four is the smugglers chapter. Um, that's always been my favorite part of this project. Anyone who knows me knows that's no secret. Um, it was a privilege to do the work with the people who I worked with, um, mostly because people are hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because I will continue to be stunned by people's ability to have a sense of humor over the darkest moments in their lives. But what's interesting about smugglers is that they are brokers, right? Um, so people are always like, oh, okay, so women are going to like smuggle. I'm like, no, it's not about women. It's that women were in brokerage roles, right? It's about that network position. And across conflicts, you see smugglers emerging from all kinds of different brokerage positions. Like I've seen um, in one place, it's bartenders, right? Bartenders, I mean, they're great for a number of reasons. Like, so like shout out to the bartenders at Jimmy's who got me through the initial part of this project. But, um, but I think the thing to remember here is that you can have people, it's, it's not an attribute-based attribute thing. It's about that network position and how people come to be. So the smugglers who I didn't actually talk about today were often co-mobilizing. It was often women who were co-mobilizing and moving through the ranks with male family members. That is not a man brought a woman into the organization that is by a function of having members of the same family in the organization meant that people could broker between different parts of the organization and would work their way up being promoted because they became valuable as a pair. That is creative, right? Because then you can find all kinds of different ways to use these sorts of relationships. And I was just talking about um, Borja Brajny and Shatila in South Beirut and these intermarriages between you know, often Sunni Palestinian, though there are Shia Palestinians in Lebanon, um, often Sunni Palestinian and Shia Lebanese, like, oh, perfect. You now have like a cross Lebanese Palestinian marriage. You can do all kinds of things with that in this context, right? Because here's the thing, like the people in that neighborhood care more about each other in many cases than like whatever highfalutin conflict is going on, right? And one of the interesting bits is that they're all engaging in disobedience. Like what that chapter gets at is the disobedience that they're engaging in to protect each other. And they're getting in all kinds of trouble. Like the pro-Syrian factions are getting in trouble with Damascus, like Arafat is yelling about stuff and they're still doing this, right? So that's interesting. Like I would say that disobedience in that context is creativity and it shifts how the organization actually presents itself and understands itself. So yeah, I would say that when it comes to plasticity, it's about those roles that emerge and then how people decide to use them. Um, would be fascinated to see how this would play out with like online stuff in the contemporary era. Like I escaped having to do all that by like, you know, having people dealing with fax machines and Xerox machines and stuff. But like someone should go forth and do that because it's super interesting, especially when you're talking about like the necessity of trust or what we often have as a, of a uh, the, what we often have as an assumption of trust, which might not actually be necessary for some of this to happen. Yeah. Laya, did you? Oh, your hands are up. Okay, let's take a couple from the, from the chat, yeah. 
Great. Oh, yeah, this is from the online audience. So thank you for a fabulous presentation. I'm sorry I could not be there in person. This is such a, a rich project. I have two questions. Uh, first question, you talk about non-combat roles and gender mobilization. Often such roles are presented as merely supporting and it's not full or real presentation. You're clearly arguing against this. Can you say more about how this speaks to gender politics and political participation? But yes, I can. <laughs> you want the second one out? Or one? No, give me the second one too. <laughs> Uh, number two, I'm curious about your access to these communities. Mm. Uh, really, have you navigated the trauma that talking about the past could lead to? Oh, navigate, oh, navigated trauma. Yes, thank you. People are giving me gifts. <laughs> All right. So as the non-combat gender roles. Um, right. There is a good amount of literature and I am arguing directly against it. The commenter is completely correct and it's extremely deliberate. That is basically like, oh yeah, women are doing the cooking and the cleaning and that's not important and that's secondary to combat. All right, so take a second and think about it in terms of what it takes to do the job. What does basic training in the US military look like? versus paramilitary training, which is what many of these women had, all right? I can give an 18-year-old guy a gun, and I can train him to shoot at the broadside of a barn because that's what an AK-47 is good with, right? I can look at the soldiers that are being fielded by Wagner right now in Ukraine, who were just released from prison and handed a gun and sent out. And then I can think about what it takes to forge a passport convincingly, which is what a lot of these support roles are, right? I think it is a misunderstanding of conflict and war to say that the 18-year-old is running the show, that the 18-year-old at the AK-47 is running the show, right? The 18-year-old is looking for promotion, or hopefully they're looking for promotion. Maybe they're looking for other things. We can go back to Wagner and think about that, right? But like quite seriously, these are high skill roles, right? Smuggling is high skill, right? If you're doing it right, <laughs> like everyone has that friend who is bad at smuggling whatever into wherever, but like smuggling thousands of dollars of cash, like, are you confident trying that out tomorrow? Like you can have an AK-47 and shoot it at the broad side of a barn and like be sort of okay at some of the roles that are necessary in an insurgency. But like, do you wanna bet your life on your ability to hide tens of thousands of dollars on your body and then convince some checkpoint to let you through? That's, that's not just, I can hide money and I won't even tell you the jokes that I have been told about where people can hide money. But it is also incredible people skills that most 16 to 18 year olds do not have. That is hard work. Right, sneaking around is hard work. Hiding people is hard work. Identifying collaborators without getting caught is hard work. It is scary work. And in a lot of cases, and this is actually, one of the memoirs that I used was um, Mom Dunolfos, who's a, a DFLP commander. And, and one of the things that he says is like, look, we're, we're losing women out there. Like they just don't come back, right? So these are the casualties that people don't see because you can't publicize what people are doing. So some of this is some of the like, oh, people aren't doing work or oh, it's cooking and cleaning is an artifact of like reporting that doesn't exist because people are good at their jobs. And if you're good at these kinds of jobs, there is no reporting on you, right? First of all, second of all, they're high skill, which is often code for boring, right? Like, like it is tedious to do a good job faking documents. Right, but like some like brash dude with like the bandolier and the AK on top of a tank or like what was it, it was a 15 year old who became really, really good inside at like shooting the turrets off of tanks. Like if you hit a certain model of tank just right with an RPG, the whole like turret will fly off. Like that's great headlines. You want war reporting? Like that's good headlines. Um, but good headlines isn't like woman spent 20 hours forging signature. But like that is the work of long protracted irregular warfare. So, and, and you know, I think about what a lot of soldiers will say is that if we think about like, let's put it in like military terms, right? Like this is the tooth to tail ratio or this is the military 
marches on its stomach, right? Like, yeah, the fighting happens, but no one thinks that it's it's sort of like occurring by itself in a vacuum or that it is the most high-skilled labor. Like the high-skilled labor is ha- occurring in other, um, in other ranks, in other divisions, and and has to be taught, right? Like how many of you can become a trauma surgeon overnight? Like these are people who were highly, highly educated and still are, right? So yeah, that's, that's I, I do think it's gendered. I do think it's partially because, um, you know, up until very recent decades, the majority of war reporters were men. In some cases, they were sexist themselves and didn't interview women. In other cases, they just didn't have access. In other cases, again, if you're in these roles, what business do you have talking to reporters? You're better than that, All right? So like it's artifacts in the data, it's artifacts of sexism, and it's scholars who don't necessarily understand what all of this looks like on the ground. You have to talk to people to understand what this looks like. Um, access um, and navigating trauma. This is obviously um, an ethically complex project. Um, that, and I was lucky to have an incredible group of advisors who talked to me and, and, uh, and honestly colleagues in my graduate program when I was doing this. And I would say mentorship throughout my career as a junior scholar with whom I talked through some of the thorniest issues, including, excuse me, I don't know if they remember, but someone on the faculty here with whom I discussed the fact that the Syrian civil war was ramping up and it might be time to stop asking questions about the war at the camps around like 2012, 2014 because it would endanger people. So things are dynamic and things change. In terms of initial access, um, I write, I have a whole methodology chapter in the book. Um, What I will say is that this took time and I let people come to me. Um, I spent two years in Lebanon. Um, I would say that the first sort of year of that block was getting to know people, was doing a lot of archival work, was being very honest about what I was there to do. And people would ask me questions about it and I would tell them what I was doing, right? So if I'm digging through archives, I'm telling them like, oh, I found this document. I found a newspaper article about this protest and people might ask me about it. They might start telling me more. They might be like, oh, okay, that's cool. And my brother-in-law is a jerk, right? Like they might just totally change the topic because being human in all of this is so deeply important. Um, I volunteered in three different organizations over the course of my research. I felt very, very seriously about um, being in exchange and visible to the communities with whom I was working um, and, you know, did a variety of things from teaching, usually surrounding teaching, right? Um, I did not ask directly. So on the trauma question, um, I did not ask directly about people's participation in any discrete violent acts. So I have friends who I know have been present for specific battles, et cetera. I'm not gonna ask them what they did. Um, If they choose to tell me, that's fine, but I'm not gonna ask like, how many people did you kill? I don't need to know that. I might not wanna know that. Um, When we talk about re-traumatization, what I'm doing, so if we think about trauma-sensitive interviewing, um, which I can, go into or if people want to email me, et cetera. Um, What I was always trying to do is ask questions about organizations and decision-making and relationships as opposed to violence. Um, I did not want to ask directly about violence in a way that could bring up memories that people didn't necessarily want to discuss um, or that could be triggering. And those are two different things, right? Um, But what I wanted to do was frame conversations around, you know, what was the organization? doing? How was healthcare working? Um, How were you publishing this newspaper? And they really did. They had to bribe the repairman so he wouldn't turn them in because like you had to get, this is back in the day when you had to get like toner for the printer um, ordered through the company. So like you had to have that person on lock, right? So those things were just more interesting to me than like the stories of participating in violence and brutality. People told me things and people also pulled me aside and were like, look, you should know this about this person or this is why this person won't talk to you about this. There are people who are not in the book because they told me stories, but they did not agree to be part of the research. They're not in the book, right? Like consent was really important. What I was interested in was really important. 
I was interested in how the organizations changed rather than personal experiences of violence. But what people would say is like, look, this is what the organization experienced. This is what it did to the structure. This is how we responded. Um, a lot of the material that I talked about today is from archives or is from um, interviews from the Palestinian oral history archive, right? So thinking about where I could get material like collaboration, I can think of one time when I asked directly about collaboration, it's in the beginning of the chapter and it's like, was and what I asked was, was there anything like the Palestinian National Guard in Sword? Um, I didn't ask who had been a collaborator. People told me, but they, it's more interesting to me when they tell me in the context of an organizational question than me asking for collaborators. I don't wanna be the, ask, the person asking about collaborators. I wanna be the person asking about organizations and decisions and adaptation and experience, if that makes sense. Um, there were times when people got upset. Upset does not ne necessarily mean traumatized. Um, it can mean traumatized. And what's really important when you're doing this kind of work is to know the difference, right? Um, there are ways of getting trained to do that kind of work, whether or not it's through social work classes, whether or not it's um, through basic, some of the training that I had was um, through uh, like the journalistic guidelines for interviewing survivors of violence and trauma. Um, there's other training I've had since, but one of the things to remember is like, it's one thing to be sad about the past and to talk about upsetting things and be able to respond, you know, psychologically, it would be called like appropriately to it. Like that's, let's like leave that term to the side. But I don't specific, like one of the things to like watch for is like, are people becoming numb, right? Do people need a break? Like, are you talking to people as a human basically and giving breaks and pacing appropriately and treating the conversation that you're having with respect? Some of the people who I spoke to about like, frankly, the worst moments of their lives, I spoke to like four five, six times. Like Zahra, I've, I knew for years, right? Some of this stuff came out four years into our relationship, right? Like one shot interviews don't do all of this. And to try to do some of this in a one shot interview would be disrespectful and, per and potentially traumatic, right? That means I don't have a second book right now. I'm sort of comfortable with that trade off, but like, who knows, maybe I don't get tenure and then I'm not comfortable with that trade off. Um, no, I will permanently be comfortable with that trade off. Um, but I think it's really important to think seriously, like particularly if you're thinking about field work, if you're thinking about journalism of like, what does it take to do this kind of work carefully, respectfully um, with an eye towards what people have been through, right? And letting them open up to you rather than deliberately probing and for what goal, right? Like the reason is like, why do you need to ask for certain forms of information? And are you prepared like literally as a competent interviewer um, to, to support someone who needs that support? And are you interviewing people in a space who actually have access to support? Um, there are places where I haven't pursued interviews on really tough topics, including with um, white humanitarians in Iraq because they did not have sufficient access to mental health care um, for talking about certain issues, right? And those are people in positions of privilege. So sort of like remembering that vulnerability is takes all kinds of forms. Um, so I've really talked for a long time on that. I could talk so much longer on this. Um, this these are issues I teach to my PhD students and to my master's students. And have written students. about, it's wonderful. And have written about, <laughs> because I really do take them seriously and because they're really important. So thank you for asking that question because it's an essential one and it should be asked with any project that looks like this. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Do we have, Lie maybe, and then we can do a couple more from the chat, Coco, if you want. But Lai, go ahead. Yeah, so what was about sterility? Um, <laughs> I mean, you may you talk about, I'm especially like on, on, on this the national agenda and this, this rivalry, like this, this far of your project. Um, do you think that this happens similarly in all regular or protracted regular wars? Mm. Or is it something unique of the case that you were studying? Because, because precisely because we cannot observe this easily. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something that we can say, well, yeah, it's how it happened in Colombia and way it happened in, in, in Nepal. I mean, uh, we will make somebody, another Sarah, to go there. 
and we don't have that many views. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, with external validity, do I think that the approach holds? Yeah, I do. Um, that doesn't mean that the empirics necessarily holds. So what's gonna interest me is like, okay, plasticity of relationships. Would there be places where relationships aren't as plastic as what I've observed? That would be intriguing to look at, right? Um, the big, big, big factor that matters here, and I can sort of see variation across factions, is the social infrastructure element. Paul Staneling gets at a bunch of that in his initial book, right? And the idea is, what is this overlap between the formal hierarchies and um, the quotidian social networks? He's going to talk about horizontal and vertical ties. It is a typology, but that basic idea of where are those intersections between the formal hierarchies and the everyday networks and which ones are they, right? In some place, it just might all be football teams. So I think you could argue, for example, that during the Egyptian uprising of 2011, um, you see the football ultras mobilized in particular ways, right? They're activated by certain types of police violence. And I use the term activation. That's again, from the neuroscience where like, you know, part of the brain lights up when something happens, like police violence is gonna make certain networks light up. And like football ultras, yeah, right? And they're gonna repurpose those ties to mobilize to new ends, right? So I so I see that present in, in some, in where you have that like infrastructure, you have the repertoire of violence that resonates in a particular way and you get the mobilization and the repurposing of these networks. Like, yeah, I see that. Um, where you may or may not get it, like what's interesting, I think that the gender aspect is really interesting to play with. I think the youth aspect is probably woefully underexplored. I actually think the elderly aspect is also underexplored for what it's worth. Because <laughs> um, elderly people get feisty at a certain point, right? But also like they have so much experience to draw upon. So thinking about how people whose children might be in political organizations, whose grandchildren might be in political organizations where something happens, I don't know, I think we could probably make a call for this in American politics with like some of the reproductive rights issues that have come back up. Like, yeah, you're gonna get people mobilizing because they're activated. They might have these old networks. They have old friends from when they were protesting in the seventies and like they're back out there, right? In a very particular way because of how they understand a particular mode of repression, right? So the model's gonna work, I would argue, across. The question is, what can you import in terms of gender, in terms of like what youth are doing? And I would be really, really careful about that because what it's always gonna be is more about those positions in terms of the overlap as opposed to gender specifically. I always think gender is gonna matter, but the question is how? Right, but I'm always going to look for those brokerage positions. Like that's where that's where the creativity is coming through. And that's not I didn't invent that. Like Ron Burt, who's a sociologist, is the one who has like this sort of core theory of like, look, brokerage, the bridges. That's where innovation occurs. So some of this is pulled from like very standard sociology. Um, it just happens to be combined with like the meaning aspect. Right, that's what I would say is one of the core contributions. So yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Okay.